have just jotted down um, a few headings and scripture points this morning. I want you to turn with me to the book of Exodus, please. Exodus chapter 3. We want to speak on this, this subject, Moses and the mountain of God. Just highlights from this chapter, Exodus chapter 3. Let's just read the first verse and then we'll read later down through some of the, verse, or the chapter. Exodus 3 verse 1. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. Father, take your word and inscribe it in every heart. Lead us through this journey, Lord, in the wilderness, the backside of the desert, as Moses did to the mountain of God. And I pray, Father, in Jesus' name, that we leave here the better for being in your house, in your presence, and under the sound of your word. Strengthen and equip, encourage and bless those that are here, those who are watching live, those who will watch later, and Lord, those who are usually with us but can't be here for one reason or another this morning, let them know your portion. Touch those that need a touch of healing. Strengthen those that need strengthened. To encourage your people. There's none like you to do the encouraging. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Moses is keeping his father-in-law Jethro's flock. He's a shepherd here. The name Moses means drawn. D R A. W N drawn. And if you wonder why they call him Moses or, or why it's because he was uh, drawn out of the water. Exodus 2 and verse 10 says, And the child grew, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called his name Moses, and she said, Because I drew him out off the water. So Moses means drawn, D-R-A-W-N. He was drawn out of the Nile. Remember, he was put in the reed basket and he was drawn out of the Nile. So in our reading, in Exodus 3 and verse 1, he leads the flock to the backside of the desert and comes to the mountain of God, it says, even to Horeb. Notice, Moses led the flock. Now notice, Moses led the flock but when we read our story, Moses was being drawn of God. Moses was leading, God was drawing. Take note, the backside of the desert, brother, the backside of the desert where Moses seems to stop at this point, the backside of the desert led him to the mountain of God. And sometimes you and I, even as an assembly, you and I, uh, as individuals, we can find ourselves walking through the backside of the desert, a place where you're, you're wondering, one, how does this happen? How do I get here? How did I get here? And it's sparse all around. And notice there was a journey even to the mountain of God. Things that you go through in your life, things that happen to you in your life, Things that happen to us in a church or assembly, it's always the things that God leads or draws us to that we'll find will bring us to the mountain of God. Where are you traveling to, Ken? I'm traveling to the mountain of God. Things seem dry, hard, difficult, sparse, rough and rugged, but Lord, where are you taking me to? I'm taking you to the mountain of God. I don't understand, Lord. I can't comprehend, Lord. I can't fathom it at this time, Lord. Where are you taking me to? I'm drawing you to the mountain of God. 
Now, whenever we think the mountain of God, it's so glorious. And we're going to look at it because it doesn't seem glorious. The thought of it is, but the practicality of when Moses get there wasn't when he got there. Notice the backside of the desert led Moses to the mountain of God. God was drawing, just like he was taken out of the night, drawn. Moses means drawn. God was drawing him, even though Moses didn't understand or know what it meant. Moses didn't, under, didn't know that one day he's going to end up seeing a burning bush. He didn't realize that, but it was in God's will, God's plan, and God's purpose. Moses had to allow the Spirit to draw him. The word here, uh, he, he led the flock to the backside of the desert. The word desert there, people think desert of, so the Sahara Desert, just pure sand when you lift it and it runs through your fingers. Or the Kalahari Desert. Or some people might think of the Arizona Desert where it's really dry, the ground is baked hard, or it's running sand. The word desert here doesn't mean that. The word, the backside of the desert here, the word desert is a word midbar. Midbar. And the midbar simply means this. It means an open field where cattle are driven to. An open field where cattle are driven to. It's a place of pasture and feeding. So the midbar was a place where the desert where Moses was wasn't just all sand that we would see. Sahara or Kalahari or Arizona or somewhere else. It meant there was dry places and the, 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 the shepherd led the sheep to places that were blooming in the desert. Maybe there was a field of pasture and then there was nothing for miles. And the shepherd knew where to go at most times. Knew where the greenery would be. And so the midbar is the place where uh, you travel maybe from one place into a drier area into another greener place. Look, in Psalm 23, and David is a shepherd boy, now an older man looking back. What does he say? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. So here we find that David as a shepherd is actually knowing that he led the flock. He led the flock from pasture to pasture, from green area to green area. And then there were times that were sparse and dry in between times. This is what happens and the further Moses went out, though, to the backside of the desert, the less those places seemed to be. So you're in a, a place in your life. It's uncertain. You're in a place in your heart that's cold, that's dry, that's spiritless. You're in a place in your life that's tough. A place in your life where you've been... You've had better days. You've been to those green pastures. You've lay beside still waters because you were close to the shepherd and he led you. And you may even say, you know, but I am reading. I am praying. I am seeking his face. But there's something here's missing. I'm reading the scripture and it's like flat to me. There's nothing. The living word isn't coming out to me. And maybe that's in place you are. you are. Listen, you keep following the shepherd, brother, sister. Keep following the shepherd because he will bring you again to green pastures. He will cause you to lie down beside the still waters. You know why it's still waters? Because if the sheep went to drink at running, rough running water, they couldn't cope with it. It caught their wood and they drowned in the rivers. Shepherd knows exactly where the feeding places are. And he knows exactly where the eating places are. Trust him. As a shepherd of a flock here, I search for those places in the word. I search for those places as I have to minister. I search for those places when I, ha when I have to uh, deal with problems. <coughs> Trying all the time to lead people to a place where I'd say you know, the, the, the green pastures or, or there's living waters where there's peace for them. Sometimes the sheep would go astray. 
Like you and I in our walk with God, we go astray. Even the hymn writer wrote, when I would wander from the path astray, yet he would call me back into the way. In the darkest valley, I need fear no will, for he, my shepherd, will be with me still. And sometimes you go through the, the, the mid bar, it's like, this was a great meeting. That was a great word. And I was encouraged and I was built up on it. The spirit of the Lord was in the meeting and his presence was real. And I drank from his, his spirit. I drank in deep this morning. I was conscious when you go home, you're going, wasn't, I just feel built up. And sometimes we travel on for a week or two or longer and it becomes dry. Every one of us go through that. Including this man. Sometimes we have to dig deep and say, we don't know where the shepherd's taken us, but where he will lead me, I will follow. I will follow. Notice the midbar, it's a place where they uh, used to drive cattle and lead the flock. Here's something for you, brother, sister. You ready? Cattle are driven. Sheep are led. Cattle now could be used, as it were, as sacrifice to the Lord. True. And there's some people that are like cattle. You try to drive them to the place, and it doesn't work. Sometimes you get them there in the feed for a while. But sheep, you lead them. You lead them. I can only tell you so many times of what the word of God is, and try to bring you the best that the Lord has given to me that I can put across to you with the help of God. I can only give to you that which the Spirit gives to me in his word. But you've got to either lead, you've got to either follow, or sometimes be driven. I can't do that for you. The word must drive you, and you must accept. It's better for sheep Listen, we are God's people, aren't we? We We're sheep. We're sheeple. Sheep people. And the shepherds lead the sheep people through the word. Try to get somewhere for you to feast on that you'll live in the spirit, that you'll live and be alive inside. The mountain of God, Moses led the flock. Sheep That is those who are his and spiritual. Not those who are, well, here nominal cattle. Moses led the flock. They followed him. And the mountain of God went to Horeb. Now Horeb is actually a mountain range. And it's in the Sinaitic mountains where Mount Sinai is, really. That's the mountain of God. And you know what Horeb means? So Midbar was dry, or or, pardon me, Midbar was patchy of plains of grass and then barren and then plains of grass where you could feast. You know what Horeb means? Dry and barren. See, Moses here is leading the flock and he takes them to Midbar because he knows where they can feast. And then he steps out further and he brings them to a place, listen, that's dry and barren. You know what it means? There's nothing really grows there. Sometimes your shepherd brings you to a place where nothing really grows. And why would he do that to you? Why would Moses lead his flock out there where nothing really grows? Because he's going to show you something greater. Sometimes you're that busy feasting and eating and growing fat on the food of God, you forget to lift your head to see him in front of you. Forget God. We take him for granted. Notice Horeb, dry desert. It is really dry. From Midbar to the mountain, (coughs) Moses was leading a flock, but God was drawing Moses. It sounds like a, a journey that's going from bad to worse. But what Moses didn't know was that Yahweh, that God was about to reveal himself I was about to talk to Moses. I'll say that again. 
What Moses didn't realize was that Yahweh, Almighty God, was about to talk to him. Well, there's nothing else there. Sometimes God brings you to a place and strips you of things. He strips you of, your, of everything that you'll see him, that you'll hear him, that you'll know him, that you'll follow him. And God was saying, Moses, this way. Moses didn't know. And one day, God spoke. You see, you don't give up and you keep trusting the leading, the drawing of the Lord. Because one day, in all of that that's surrounding you, in all of that that's going on, God will reveal the plan. God will speak his word to you. And listen, when he speaks his word to you, It may be something you didn't want to hear. When you're through the midbar, oh, it's patchy here, there's not too much. You get further into the Horeb, the dry place where there's nothing. It's there you'll see his glory more than what you'll do when you're in your comfort zone. You'll know God's revelation. You'll hear God's voice clearer and easier, plainer. When everything else is shut out from you, taken away, there's only one voice to hear. God could be trying to speak to you, to lead you and to guide you. He sent people to you. He's even shouted, as it were, at you, preached to you through, through, through the pulpit and through his word. He's spoken to you by different ones who's met you on the road and you can't hear his voice for everybody else's. So he calls you and suddenly you're at this dry place. Oh, what am I going to do? And you turn to him. Oh, you've mentioned his name before. In the middle of doing everything else, you turn to him. And he is the one who's drawn you. When you're drawn to God into a place which is the most unlikely venue, as Moses was, don't be surprised, brother, and don't be surprised, sister, when God gives you a task to do. In Exodus 3 and verse 1, Moses didn't know, as I said, that he was being drawn. In Exodus chapter 3, if you look at it, And verse 2, and the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. And he looked and behold, the bush was burned with fire and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight why the bush is not burnt. Why the bush is not burnt. Now, it is said that generally the shepherds of the day would have left their hometown or place where they lived with their flock, led them just one day's journey. Just one day's journey. That's, they wouldn't have went. They had a trail that they followed for they knew the patches of the midbar. Here's grazing, there's water. There's water and here's grazing. And they would have went just one day's journey. It's said here by the commentators, that by the time Moses got to the mountain of God, he was at least three days journey away. I thought about that and I thought, Moses, you had to really step out here. Moses went out not knowing, as it were, where he was going. He ended up at a mountain of, the mountain of God. And sometimes you see brothers and sisters, we say, Lord, use me, use me. Preachers say, use me, use me. Well, the Lord says every street corner is a pulpit. Go and preach the gospel. Singers say, use me, use me. Every corner you can stand and sing the gospel. Moses was going out not knowing, as it were, where he was going for three days instead of one. The number three, you know, excuse me, in scriptures, it's uh, three, the three is mentioned 467 times in the King James Bible, the number three. 
I think now, I think the only number that is more mentioned is the number seven. So three is the number of witnesses we know. But listen, three also in scripture, for example, there were three angels or three angelic presence came to Abraham at his tent door, remember at Mamre? And that was a reason. One stayed with Abraham and two went and destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Notice God's grace and God's judgment. Three patriarchs of Israel, our father Abraham, then Isaac and Jacob. Three patriarchs. God had to set that in plan and in motion. Notice Daniel. Daniel chapter 6 prayed three times a day, set his face towards Jerusalem with the windows open. Three is very important because Daniel was the great witness in Babylon, if you remember. And then we have, of course, in 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, and in verse 8, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. God's manifestation of himself as the Father, the Word, or the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. There's three that bear witness on the earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. Can you see this? I know what it is. It gives strength to something. And, and when I thought of this as three days, I thought, wow, Lord, you drew him out to give strength to some, about something here. That Moses had to trust and walk through, keep walking, even though he didn't know what way things were going to go. And he went out, and he went out day two, and he went out day three. And it was there in Horeb, not in the midbar, he finds that God appears to him. The old saying is, brother, sister, Lord, I want more of you. Lord, would you use me? The old saying is, you know, you know people praying. And, that's, and, and I'm, not, I'm not condescending to that. I'm saying that to try and help. Sometimes people say, Lord, I want more of your presence and more of your spirit. And I want to see more of your miraculous, wonder-working power. Brothers and sisters, as the old saying is, if you want to walk in water, you've got to get out of the boat. Peter didn't walk on water until he stepped out of the boat. Expecting more of God. Trusting more in God. Going through more for God. And notice, we also have a three, number three, a satanic trinity. The systems of our, this world with the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet book of Revelation. Three gives, let me put it like this, this table, this is already breaking a bread table, in case nobody noticed. Length by breadth is twice, isn't that right? That's the witness of it. Length by breadth of the measurements of the table. So there's a witness two or three. Here is the length and the breadth of the table. But to put depth on that table, that would just be flat glass on the ground there. But to put depth, meaning sightfulness, that you can recognize it as a table, not a piece of glass on the floor. It needed the third dimension, length, breadth, and depth. And so you can see through the scripture, why three, showing us the revelation of God, the Godhead, of the other in three days, God is about to reveal something to Moses. The strength of it, can you see? There's always a plan and a purpose with God. You know, it says an angel of the Lord appeared to him, but really this angel isn't an angel with wings. It's God himself in the burning bush. It's God himself in a bush. And some have tried to say, oh, well, uh, and these are some commentators that I've read. Some say it was the light came down and shone through. And at that time of the evening, it would have been just something that was glowing. It looked like it was burning. As commentators say that. Some commentators said it was a red uh, sort of leaf on the bush. Or, or stick on the bush or twig on the bush and, and it looked red and in the sunlight it looked like it was on fire. Brothers and sisters, the bush was on fire. 
a miracle right before him. The bush was on fire. And it wasn't consumed. John Wesley says, if you want people to get people to come uh, to hear you speak, and he says, get on fire for God and they'll come to see you burn. In other words, brother, sister, in our testimonies, I can't even mention this morning, in our testimonies, get on fire for God. See if God, see if people see a weak and a watery testimony. See if people see a weak and watery Christian. See if people see a, a, a person that's, uh, that's uh, no, no heart for God. If people see someone who's foolish with the gospel, who's foolish in the things of God, do you know what happens? I don't want that God. Christians that are in the world, I don't want that God. I don't want this God. Get on fire for God. And people come to see you burn. Three, the gifts of the Holy Ghost. There's nine of them, isn't that right? But they're in three groups of three. For example, the vocal gifts, tongues, interpretation of tongues and prophecy. So I haven't time to go into them, but because I've taught on those before, three groups of three for the nine gifts. So God strengthens his word here, and he's drawing Moses to show him something greater. And brothers and sisters, if we as a church, if we as an assembly, we not just say, well, we'll take in the word. I'm in the midbar, so I've been fed with something this morning that's helped me. And by the time we get home and have our dinner, well, I'm comfortable now. That'll do me for another month. Or that'll do me for another week. Or that'll do me for the rest of the day. Brothers and sisters, throw off all of this stuff and get on fire for God. Throw off the lethargy and the laziness. Throw off the old man and throw off the old woman. Get on fire for God. Notice here, the angel of the Lord appears. And Moses has now traveled about three days. Here's something I want you to see. In the, in the workings of God, we don't know or understand. But I took a, a, a quotation from two old Puritans. One was John Flavel. And he says, some providences of God, like Hebrew letters, must be read backwards. You know, we have our letters going from left to right. Hebrews read from right to left. And sometimes we're walking and we'll not understand it because we're reading it the wrong way. We're reading the problem, the thing, whatever it is, the wrong way. We're reading the circumstance the wrong way. We're reading the desert, the midbar the wrong way. We're reading the journey the wrong way. And we're reading it. We get to the end of it. We can't understand what we've read because it's meant that we look back and we see God's providences the whole way through it. Like Hebrew letters must be read from the opposite direction. And listen to Thomas Watson on the providence of God. There are three things in providence. God's foreknowing. God's determining. God's directing all things to their periods and events. Do you know God has had you here this morning? You know, God has you listened to this word to help you this morning, to instruct you this morning, to bring nourishment, encouragement, and fulfillment. God's drawing and God's directing brought Moses and the flock. Listen, I want you to, this is what I jotted down. It's just, I wrote it and I just jotted it as it came to me. God's drawing and God's directing brought Moses and the flock from the natural into the supernatural. Old, earthy, midbar, plain from here to there, it's sparse to feed right into the desert. Sandy, dry and barren. God brought them there. This is all it is. We're just dust. So we'll return to 
but he showed the supernatural among all that natural. I need a supernatural move of God. Well, I want to tell you something. We've got a supernatural God. I need a supernatural move of God. Listen, see that which is supernatural to you? It's only natural to God. It's only natural to him. God's drawing, God's directing brought Moses and the flock from the natural to the supernatural, from the temporal into the eternal, from the mundane to the mountain, from the surrounding desert into the presence of deity. Some of these days you keep, you keep going. You might even be mid-bar uh, feeders. It's not all blessing. The Christian walk is not all blessing. It's not all mountaintop because there's plenty of valleys. It's not all greenery and grass and grazing. There's wilderness, desert experiences, dryness, and barren times. But here's the thing, brother. Catch this. Here's the thing, sister. In the midst of all of that, he's leading his flock. He's leading you. Let me look at this quickly. Exodus 3 and verse 2. The angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Notice the angel. So here's the first thing. Moses is walking, catches a bush on fire. Now, the thing about this was, the bush was not consumed. See, in the heat out there, bushes would have just instantaneously went into fire, uh, burst into flames. He had seen these sort of things before. But this one was different. It went on fire in the heat of the day and the dryness of that desert. It, it just combusted into flames like others maybe would have before. But this one, he can't. Can you see him looking? There's one other bush on fire. That's still in fire. That's still burning. That's not being consumed. That's impossible. It's impossible. Here we find the Lord drew Moses. In verse 4, let's read down to 3 and 4. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him. Notice, when the Lord saw, he turned aside to see. Many times has God tried to get your attention, brother, your attention, sister. Now, there's nothing to take the attention of Moses. God's saying all the time, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. I'm here. Listen, here's another three for you. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. I wonder, that were you conscious of him in the midst of us this morning? I was. Very much so. weren't conscious because of this or that or the other. Moses turns aside and that's when God starts to reveal more to him. Take the time at home to sit in the word. Drop the magazines or whatever you're reading. Go to the word. Cut out your TV even for a while and go to the word. Social media. If you spend more time in the Word than social media, you'll do better. Social media, but people send me stuff all the time. I have to really, I look at it and I go, I can't get away from this thing because people keep sending me stuff. I'm trying to answer them. It's become like an, I'm like an office with it. Sometimes I have to just sit in another room and go, and go into my room. And brothers and sisters, God reveals himself through his word. So first four, first two, we have the angel of the Lord. First four, we have the voice of the Lord. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called, out, on, called unto him out of the midst of the bush. Here's the voice of God. Let's read on. And he said, draw not nigh hither, put thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. Brothers and sisters, we don't really seem to understand this a lot because 
Moses was coming up. He's being drawn all this time to God. But seeing the burning bush, he turns aside. God speaks and he starts to go toward it like this. It's the idea of it. And the Lord says, stop there, Moses. Take your shoes from off your feet. It was a custom then to take the shoes off the feet. It showed an act of reverence and worship. How dare you come into my presence? Now take off your shoes. In other words, how dare you come into my presence and not worship me? I wonder what it will be like that day when there are those who haven't worshipped him. Stand before him. Take thy shoes from off thy feet for the place where thou stand. This is holy ground. Holy ground. It's just sand. It's just rocks and old dry rugged mountains. That's all it is. It, it's just a it just used to be a this used to be a bar, a club, a nightclub, or whatever, a, a dance hall in here. And that's all it is. But I can tell you one thing, brothers and sisters, since we have come in here, and God has moved on it, and since we have come in here, the Lord has sanctified it with his presence. He has sanctified the place with his presence. The desert, his presence sanctified it. The tabernacle in the wilderness that came, God sanctified it in his presence. His presence with it. The temple in Jerusalem, God sanctified it with his presence. Listen, the temple which is his body, you and I, God has sanctified it with his presence. So, we find here the holiness of God in verse 5. Take your shoes from off your feet. I am holy. What about when he's in our midst? Listen, see sometimes even whenever there's a ministry in the spirit, see if we're standing worshiping, don't sit down. Stand in his presence. Reverence him. In verse 6, we have his proclamation. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Here's the number three coming up again. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. See the difference now? Moses, take your shoes off. You worship me. Now he realizes, I'm in the presence of God. Brothers and sisters, see when we are here and we are worshiping. See when we're here, even under the word in the presence of God, you should be afraid to move off your seat. You should be afraid to move off your seat. reverence him I remember a pastor in our church and a man came to me one time and he says pastor please 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 talk to that man sitting beside me and I says why what's wrong he says every Sunday he comes and he fills his mouth full of mint imperials I says well how fresh breath what's wrong with that he says that's not the problem he rattles him around his mouth like a cement mixer that's the words he used I hear them, I hear these mint and pearls. He says he just keeps putting three and four in at a time. He's crunching them and he says, I can't stick it anymore. He says, you ever think about in seats? Please say something. I says, how can I tell someone to stop eating mint and pearls in the church? So I thought about it. And I says, we're going to sing hymn number, whatever it was. Let's sing this. The hills of Zion yields a thousand sacred sweets. See? Before we reach the heavenly fields. And I says, now we're going to sing it again. Now this doesn't mean sweets in church. <laughs> Didn't work anyhow, but anyway. But you understand, I'm not even talking about eating a sweet. Please don't, please don't get me wrong. But what I'm talking about is this. We need to reverence his presence. Respect him. In verse 7, we have his omniscience. He says, in verse 7, moreover, or pardon me, and the Lord said, 
I have surely seen the affliction of my people. He knew it. He saw it. Israel and Egypt have seen the affliction of my. That's his omniscience. In verse 8, his omnipotence. Notice, and I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. Here's the all-powerful one. Here's his omnipotence. I'll deliver them. And then in verse 14, he tells his name. Notice, he says, And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. That's my name. Brothers and sisters, I have a lot more. I may do another week, we'll see. I just felt the Lord laid that on my heart. He laid it on my heart too. To bring it this morning. Lord, what are you doing with me? I don't know. Just keep following. Just keep trusting. Just keep believing. Just you hold on because you might get even worse. Your situation may seem to be going from bad to worse, but then suddenly you just keep looking for him. And whenever that thing else is put out of your mind and your life, you know what you find? You find him again. He reveals himself. Brings you closer. Listen, send this in close. Maybe look at it next week. I don't know. Wait and see. The Lord says, I'm going to send you back to Egypt. And he says, Lord, I can't, I can't speak right to that. I mean, I have, my speech has got a stammer, he says. And, you know, I, I'm not really great at speaking. And, and Lord, who am I going to say sent me? Do you know what he had? He had already a on his mind before he even went. Did you ever do that? He already took it out of context. The Lord says, I am that I am. You know what it means? I'm everything. <coughs> Basically, I'm everything you need. I am him. Beginning and ending, the first and the last, Alpha and Omega. I am him. Everything at all times, in all places with my people. God bless his word to each and every one of us this morning.